Hey, how's everyone doing? Thank you. Thanks very much. Some conference speakers in the audience that know how it feels. Um, I'm Sam Goads, and I'm a co-founder at Box. And uh, for the last two years, I've been working with a team to deploy Kubernetes. And today, I'd like to talk about platforms. So what is a platform? Well, I looked online for a definition, like the Merriam-Webster Sebs kind of thing, and I couldn't find one I liked. So I did what any good speaker does, and I made one up. A platform abstracts away a messy problem so you can build on it. So let's go over a few more popular ones. Linux gives you an abstraction over the multitude of hardware devices that exist in the world, giving you a consistent set of syscalls that you can build against. Java provides high-level uh, provides high-level abstractions over the low-level interfaces of individual operating systems. And Twilio takes a mishmash of operator-specific APIs and interfaces that are a nightmare to deal with and provides a clean, consistent API to communicate. And platforms provide a lot of value to the world, and they do that in very, two very specific ways. By enabling portability across a wide variety of environments and interfaces, and providing stable APIs to enable extensibility. So let's take Linux as an example. Well, Linux runs on nearly all hardware today, so developers don't have to worry about directly supporting different network cards or disk drives or file systems. Instead, they can focus on writing and delivering their application code, allowing Linux to abstract away the messy problem of all these different devices. And in terms of extensibility, the Linux kernel provides stable APIs and interfaces that enable a world of tooling that would be impossible if you had to interact directly with CPUs or network cards or file systems. So on these two dimensions of portability and extensibility, how does cloud infrastructure do as a platform? Well, I had an artist rendition drawn up. It's not good, guys. It's not good. In fact, it's really bad. And while that may be surprising to you, it, there's a reason that it's so bad is if you objectively evaluate cloud infrastructure as a platform in those two dimensions, it doesn't do very well. So let's do that now. And to do that, we're going to put these in a matrix, because how can you evaluate anything if it's not in a matrix, let's be honest. And let's start with portability. So let's say I'm at Box, and I'm uh, developing a microservice in Python. So I go ahead and package it up in a Docker image, and I'm ready to ship it. But to run it, not only do, you know, do I need to run this image, I need also a Postgres database to back it. And ideally, I'd have a persistent remote disk as well. Now, I'd also want an auto-scaling group so my service doesn't get overwhelmed. And then I'd need a load balancer in front of that auto-scaling group. And I would need service discovery for all these components to be able to find each other. So to run my application properly, this is the kind of operational setup I need. The Python microservice is not enough. And so if we ever only needed to run this on one kind of cloud infrastructure, it wouldn't be that big of a problem, we'd be able to implement it and be done. But at Box, we may want to run this microservice on public cloud. We may want to run it in our own data centers, on a private cloud, on OpenStack. Or we may even want to run it in our customers' data centers on bare metal. But we can't, because there's no way to write a single spec or design that goes across different cloud providers. And I'll show you why. So across the top here, we have the top five most popular ways that someone might run infrastructure. And on the left, we have the feature set required by my application that I just drew up, by the microservice that we have. So if you want auto-scaling to be implemented in your application, each of these different providers has a different way of looking at it. In Amazon, you have an autoscaling group. In Google, you have a dedicated resource called an autoscaler. In Azure, you have a scale set. In OpenStack, you have a heat scaling policy. And in bare metal, you really have no option at all. 
So, and it's not just that these are named differently. They're actually fundamentally different concepts that have different nuances and APIs and semantics to the point that it's very difficult to create an abstraction over them. Next, let's look at load balancing. Similar story. Elastic load balancer on Amazon. Google has a load balancer. Azure has a different one. OpenStack is load balancer as a service. And again, on bare metal, we really don't have a good option. And finally, with remote storage, again, similar story. And what about service discovery? So my application can find the database that's backing it. Well, none of these providers have a good solution for that. And so you're really left in the dark for trying to provide a solution or a spec or an architecture that goes across all these providers. So you might be saying, well, OK, you're just looking at the wrong layer. You need to go up a layer. You can't just look at the infrastructure providers. And we did that. So we looked at a lot of different options. Uh, frequently, these are called platforms as a service. But the problem with these is that their primary goal has always been to provide functionality first and be an abstraction layer second, if at all. So what you end up with is a bunch of tools that are either completely proprietary, like Heroku, or they're optimized for 12-factor apps, like Cloud Foundry, or they heavily depend on public cloud infrastructure and virtual machines like Spinnaker. So when you're trying to design this application, not just as the code that you've written, but as the full package of what a cloud application really is today, or a cloud service, it's basically a fantasy to be able to design this once and have it run anywhere. And imagine if you're a developer trying to ship an application like this to your customers. It gets even harder, because really all you can provide is a Docker image, which is um, just even a pretty new development. And once you provide that, you just have to hope that your developers or that your end users are able to operationalize your software properly and run it correctly in whatever environment they may have. So how do we do on portability? Thumbs down. Well, actually, it's, it's not a full thumbs down. It's a little crooked, because Docker images really have made things a lot better than tarballs and RPMs and that kind of scenario. But uh, it's still like pretty down. So next, let's look at extensibility. So for extensibility, the, one of the best ways you can tell if a platform is extensible is what kind of tooling you can build against it. So now I'd like everyone to imagine for a moment a few examples of different kinds of tooling we could build against a cloud platform. So for the first one, let's imagine a tool that could show you in your entire cluster all the different applications that are running, the resources that they're using, up to, updated up to the second, and whether it's CPU or memory or network, and have it visually displayed and sorted and organized so you can easily see at any given time what's going on in your infrastructure, regardless of where your infrastructure is running or what cloud infrastructure your provider you're using. So let's call that visualizer. There's a reason I'm not in marketing. So next, let's imagine a tool that automatically balances instances of your application across many different cloud providers. So let's say um, uh, you want public cloud when prices are low, but you want to switch over to your bare metal data centers when you're not able to get enough spot instances. Or depending on different fluctuations in the market or different traffic patterns, you want to switch between different ways of, of balancing your application and, and where you're predominantly running it, all without any kind of manual intervention. So we'll call that a federator. And next, imagine a tool that could bootstrap and resize and back up a stateful database. Again, all automatically, all without intervention. And we'll call that an operator. And the challenge is these tools are next to impossible to build today in a way that's universal for everyone running in the cloud. And so it's very, very difficult to build against this platform. And the big issue is that there's almost no incentive to build these tools in a universal way because there's so much fragmentation in the market. So you don't get the advantage of the largest organizations who typically have their own bare metal data centers or their own infrastructures. You don't get to leverage their engineering resources to help enable and build tooling for the greater community. 
So if we go back and we rate extensibility, we get full thumbs down. So this is not good. We can do better than this. And as you might be able to guess, I believe there's a solution to all of this that I'm really excited to tell you all about. A piece of software that solves all the aforementioned problems in an incredible way. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> just having some fun, seeing if everyone's awake. Uh, okay, Kubernetes. Surprise, surprise. Um, okay, why Kubernetes? Why? Well, number one, it's optimized for all your infrastructures. Okay? It runs on public cloud, private cloud, bare metal, the five Raspberry Pis you have in your garage that are serving your lossless discography of the Beatles. I don't know. Whatever you have, Kubernetes will run on it. It'll run amazingly well, and it's optimized for all those environments. For all applications, so it doesn't matter if it's Linux or Windows, doesn't matter if it's stateless or stateful, Kubernetes is on its way to supporting every kind of application you can manage, imagine. If it's a binary and it runs, it can run in Kubernetes. A known and stable API that you can build incredible tooling against that abstracts away that really messy problem of all those infrastructure providers and their implementation details. And finally, and by far I think this is the most important point, it's all the folks in this room right here. It's the unparalleled team and community that is working on this project. And if anyone, whenever somebody asks me why not Mesos or Marathon or Swarm or Triton or Titus, it's because it's I think this team and the community that's around this project is incredible and one of the most incredible ever assembled in the open source world. Yeah, round of applause for everyone here. And, and to be specific for a moment, for example, you have the folks from Google coming in bringing over a decade of containerization experience. You have the folks from Red Hat making sure Kubernetes runs super well on every single enterprise environment, even the most constrained. And you have people from CoreOS working for, on making sure that, or basically, making Kubernetes the only sane way to run infrastructure in bare metal. And everyone else in this room who are using Kubernetes and contributing and discussing on the mailing list and issues, it's really incredible to watch. And I've never seen a community that has such openness and transparency and inclusion as I have in this one. So let's be honest about this, though, and let's evaluate Kubernetes now on these two dimensions. So let's start with portability. Well, if you remember our microservice earlier, every one of those features and sets that I needed in the cloud infrastructure is represented by a Kubernetes native object that is portable across all the different cloud providers. So now I can write one JSON spec and submit that to any Kubernetes cluster running anywhere and be able to recreate exactly the right topology and ex exactly the right infrastructure that I need. And again, imagine if I'm a developer. I can provide Kubernetes specs and be confident that no matter whatever, whatever infrastructure someone is running, they're going to be able to run these and be able to tweak them and modify them to their needs. And I can give a really good example of how the application that I'm providing should be run. And so if you remember this really messy matrix, what's going to happen with Kubernetes as your cloud provider is all that is going to shift up there, and we're going to be able to abstract away all the providers below. We finally have a portable abstraction to work against in cloud infrastructure. So what do we do? Thumbs up. So now extensibility. And I just want to pause for a second and say this is what I am most excited about for the future of Kubernetes. So if you're only going to get one thing from this talk, it's this next piece here. So do you remember all those tools we imagined that would be amazing if everybody that runs on the cloud could leverage and invest in? Well, they're all projects today that are either in development or, or just released for Kubernetes as a cloud platform. 
So the first one is dashboard, the Kubernetes UI. That is able to show you all the resource utilization inside your cluster. The next one is cluster federation, which has an amazing team working on it, which will be able to automatically balance your application across different, anything from public cloud providers to private cloud and even to bare metal. And if some of you saw the announcement recently about etcd operator that CoreOS released, I think it's honestly one of the most exciting things I've seen in cloud infrastructure because it's a never before seen level of automation and intelligence around your infrastructure that's again portable and agnostic to every provider in every way that you can run your infrastructure. So on extensibility, another thumbs up. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so Kubernetes has the opportunity to be the new cloud platform. And a lot of my talk today was really focused on not just the present, but the future as well, of what Kubernetes can become. I think the tooling we're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. I think the amount of innovation and leverage that's going to come from being able to standardize on Kubernetes as a platform is incredibly exciting, more exciting than anything I've seen in the last 10 years of working on the cloud. And we have an opportunity here in this room to do what AWS did for infrastructure, but this time in an open, universal, community-driven way. We can build tooling that people today only dreamt of having and truly up-level the next generation of developers. Thank you.